I don't know about you, uh, but I am so grateful uh, to have been born in the United States of America. And I say that not because we are a wealthy nation, although we are a wealthy nation, not because we are a powerful nation, although that may be true, but we are a nation uh, that was founded on biblical principles. In fact, uh, most of the signers of our declaration were uh, very committed followers of Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, uh, the gospel has gone uh, through our nation and from our nation. And in reality, because of that, it has been fairly easy to be a follower of Jesus in our culture. Uh, it is why when we look at different things that have happened over the last several decades of other uh, followers of Jesus, other disciples of Jesus in other countries, that we are aghast when we see these uh, Christians, these brothers or sisters in Christ being marched out onto a beach and then beheaded because they would not renounce the name of Jesus. It is hard for us to understand that level of persecution, that level of sacrifice, because uh, we have been birthed out of a belief, out of a commitment uh, to the gospel, to uh, Jesus Christ. And so for us, it is hard to understand that level of persecution, that level of sacrifice. And yet, uh, some believe that as we continue to move forward, that it will be more and more costly for people who swear allegiance to Jesus, even in our own culture. And so today, I want to talk about how to be faithful to Jesus in the face of opposition. How to be faithful to Jesus in the face of opposition. And we are in a series uh, from the book of Revelation. Um, and in the book of Revelation, in chapters 1, 2, and 3, this is what we've been looking at and focusing on. But in chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation, Jesus dictates some letters to some specific churches in real time and real space where he talks to them about the struggles that they have, about the deficiencies that they have, and what he wants them to do in response. And today, we're going to look at, a, at one of the churches uh, that, does have, uh, that doesn't have any condemnation from Jesus. Only uh, thing that Jesus does for them is he encourages and affirms them because of the severe trials they were going through. And so if you have a Bible and would like to follow along, I would encourage you to take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 2, and we'll begin by reading in verse 8. And this is what it says, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. Write to the angel of the church in Smyrna. So Smyrna is the church that we're going to be looking at today. And as I said last week, when it says write to the uh, angel of the church, uh, the, the Greek word for that is really messenger. It could be also translated messenger. And so there are a lot of different ideas about uh, who is this one that these letters are being delivered to. And so some people think that it's a literally heavenly being, that every local church has a guardian angel so to speak. Uh, other people believe that uh, because it's a messenger, maybe it was the, uh, was the actual pastor of that church or maybe one of the other leaders, or still some uh, believe that it was maybe delivered to someone who was the official reader, the, the official messenger. And so when any scripture was written or read to the congregation, that they would read this. And so maybe that's what it was. We really don't know, uh, but it's one of those things. But that's what, it, uh, that's what all the options are for there. And then, it, and then Jesus says, write to the church uh, in Smyrna. Now, Smyrna uh, uh, is about 30 to 35 miles north of Ephesus. If you'll remember last, uh, last week, we looked at Ephesus, which was a port city, and just about 30 to 35 miles north was Smyrna, which is another port city. Now, Smyrna was a very proud Roman city. In fact, uh, they wanted to be number one. If, if they were uh, planting cities, they would say, you know, that, that we're the first city in Rome. In other words, it's kind of like planting churches where they say, we're the first Baptist or first Presbyterian or what. They wanted to be first on the map. Uh, they were very proud of their heritage in terms of being a part of the Roman Empire. And so uh, uh, they wanted everyone to be a part of that. Uh, Ephesus, as we saw last week, had a big uh, temple, one of the seven wonders of the world. And Smyrna didn't have a big temple, but they had several temples. In fact, one of their temples was dedicated to the worship of one of the Roman emperors. And so they literally uh, encouraged worship of the Roman emperors. And so they would say uh, in, um, in their day, they would say that Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. Does that sound familiar? 
That created problems for people who didn't think that Caesar was Lord. For example, it created problems for disciples of Jesus who claimed that Jesus is Lord. And so uh, they wanted everybody in the city of Smyrna, they wanted everybody to proclaim their allegiance to Caesar. They wanted everyone saying that Caesar is Lord. Uh, They had about 100,000 people. It was a wealthy city and they were very proud of their national identity and that created a problem uh, for the Christians because the Christians could not, could not swear allegiance to Caesar. Now, um, Paul, we believe, probably planted the church in Smyrna. Uh, Paul went and he planted the church in Ephesus. He spent two years in Ephesus, uh, and we believe that he went beyond Ephesus in that region and helped plant other churches. In fact, the reason why we say that is this is what Acts chapter 19, verse 10 talks about, about the time of the two years that he spent in in the area of Ephesus. It says, this went on for two years, his ministry in Ephesus, so that all the residents of Asia, Asia Minor, this area where these seven churches are, both Jews and Greeks heard the word of the Lord. And so we believe that uh, perhaps Paul planted the church in Smyrna. Uh, And we believe also that depends on when uh, the letter of of Revelation was written, uh, that it was uh, during the days of someone that you may have heard of from history, uh, a guy by the name of Polycarp. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Yeah, Polycarp was one of the first disciples. In fact, uh, the Apostle John, who's the writer of the book of Revelation for us, uh, he was a disciple of John. He was a pupil of John. And so uh, it, he was martyred for his faith in AD 155. And you probably uh, maybe have heard of his story about how he uh, was burned at the stake. But we believe that during the time that John was writing, especially if John wrote in the mid-90s AD, uh, that Polycarp may in fact have been uh, the pastor or uh, the church tradition says that he was the bishop of the church in Smyrna. And so this letter may have been really hand-delivered to Polycarp. And um, Polycarp's life gives us a little bit of a clue of what was going on uh, in Smyrna. In fact, uh, William Hendrickson in his commentary on the book of Revelation talks about uh, Polycarp's death. He says this, faithful to the death, this venerable leader was asked to say Caesar is Lord, but he refused. Brought to the stadium, the proconsul urged him saying, swear and I will see, uh, set thee at liberty. In other words, set you free. Reproach Christ. In other words, denounce Christ. Polycarp answered, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never did me any injury. How then can I now blaspheme my king and my savior? When the proconsul again pressed Polycarp, the old man answered, Since thou art vainly urgent that I should swear by the fortune of Caesar, and pretendest not to know who I am or what I am, hear me declare with boldness, I am a Christian." A little later, the proconsul answered, I have wild beasts at hand. To these I will cast thee, except thou repent. In other words, deny Christ. I will cause thee to be consumed by fire, seeing that thou despisest the wild beast, if thou wilt not repent. But Polycarp said, Thou threatenest me with fire, which burneth for an hour, and after a little while is extinguished. But you are ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. So why tarriest thou? Bring forth what thou wilt. And so uh, it is recorded that people started to bring uh, wood and sticks, and there was a stake, and they uh, grabbed Polycarp to bind him and to tie him to the stake so that they would burn him alive. And Polycarp said, there is no need to bind me, I will stand here freely. And he did, and he was burned at the stake. And so uh, the people in Smyrna in AD 155 had zero tolerance for people who would not swear allegiance to Caesar being the Lord. This is the environment in which this church and probably Polycarp, his entire ministry, his entire uh, experience of leadership there uh, experienced. And so Jesus says, I want you to write to the church at Smyrna 
Thus saith the first and the last. In other words, Jesus is claiming here, again, we saw this in a few weeks ago, uh, where in chapter one, there is a revelation, there's a vision of Jesus that John writes down, and uh, John sees this description of Jesus, and what Jesus does in these seven letters is he takes a part of that vision that John had, and he ascribes himself uh, specific characteristics to each of the seven churches. And most of these characteristics in these seven churches really line up with what they're going through, what they're experiencing. And so here, Jesus reminds the church at Smyrna that he is the first and the last. We remember what uh, John wrote about uh, about God the Father in chapter 1. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. In other words, I'm the beginning and and the last. And what Jesus is doing here is he's letting the church, reminding the church in Smyrna, no, I am the eternal God. This phrase, I am the first and the last, is not just something that Jesus was playing off of, of the Alpha and Omega. It was actually a title that the prophet Isaiah used of God the Father again and again and again in the book of, uh, in the book of Isaiah. He would say again and again, God is the first and the last. And Jesus is very directly saying he is claiming divinity. He's basically saying to the church in Smyrna, I am the sovereign God. I am control of all things. Nothing goes without my knowledge. And then he says, I am the one who also was dead and came to life. In other words, um, the, the greatest enemy that we face, the greatest fear that many people have is that of death. And Jesus is saying, there's no need to fear because I have been dead. I was raised again. In other words, I conquered death. The worst that can happen to you is nothing because I was dead and I came back. I I conquered the grave. And so these words from Jesus to the believers in Smyrna would have been a great comfort, a reminder that he is God, he is in control of all things, and the worst thing that can possibly happen to them, he's already defeated. And then he says uh, in verse 9, I know your affliction. That word could also be translated tribulation. Some versions uh, say tribulation there. The, the word uh, affliction there is, uh, refers to a pain that someone experiences, it's brought on from something that's external to a person. In other words, I didn't do anything uh, to experience this pain. I didn't do anything to experience this heartache, uh, but this is being uh, imposed on me from the outside. And what was their tribulation? What was the cause of their tribulation? Well, most likely it was their refusal to confess Caesar as Lord. And when they were pressed to confess that Caesar is Lord, they would not. They would say, Jesus is Lord. And in the city of Smyrna, there were other cities that you could get by with that, but in the city of Smyrna, because of their national pride, because of their, they wanted to be like the number one city in the Roman Empire, they had zero tolerance for that kind of pushback. And so what would happen? A lot of bad things would happen to a person if they would not confess that Caesar was Lord. And as we read this from Jesus, you would expect the next thing that Jesus were to say is, hey, don't worry, I'm going to make it all better. (laughs) Because in our culture, in our country, in our experience, uh, it, it is easy to be a follower of Jesus. It really is. And yet again and again and again uh, in the scriptures, we find that um, disciples of Jesus face tribulation. And there's not a promise anywhere in the scripture where Jesus says, I'm going to deliver you from all of your problems. You'll never have a problem. You'll never have a heartache. You'll never have anything that uh, happens that's bad to you. And a lot of people, they struggle with that. In fact, the apostle Paul would write to the church in Thessalonica. um, He would say this to them in chapter 3, verses 2 to 5. He says this, and we sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage you concerning your faith. Why? So that no one will be shaken by these afflictions. Same word that's used in Revelation 2 that Jesus uses. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. Appointed to what? Uh, We're going to have affliction. We're going to have tribulation. 
Paul was very clear about this, and he was concerned because they started to experience this affliction, this tribulation, and so he says, I, I sent Timothy in order to strengthen you and to encourage you. Why? Because you're, um, it was getting difficult. And then he says uh, in verse 4, in fact, when we were with you, we told you in advance that we were going to experience affliction. There's that word again. And as you know, we were right. That's not, that's not when you want to hear somebody say, I told you. Told you so. And then he says in verse 5, For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I also sent him, Timothy, to find out about your faith, fearing that the tempter had tempted you and that your labor and that our labor might be for nothing. What's he saying here? He's saying this. He's recognizing the reality that when things get difficult for disciples of Jesus, there is a temptation to turn away from Jesus so that things aren't so difficult. There's a spirit of compromise in us. And Paul understands this. And Paul realized that they were facing external pressure, external pain, and he sent Timothy in order to strengthen them because he was concerned that if they weren't encouraged, if they weren't strengthened, that they in fact would turn from Jesus, even though they had been warned. This happens uh, in our day. Not to the degree that maybe it was in the church of Smyrna, but because we've had it so easy and we've had this idea that um, being a disciple of Jesus kind of clears the path for us. When things um, happen to us that we don't want or that we weren't expecting, we get frustrated with God. God, why did you allow this to happen? Why did you allow them to catch this disease? Why did you allow... Um, someone to die. Why did you allow this to happen? Because God, I love you. I'm committed to you. I, I'm, I'm faithful. I give. I serve. I do all of these things. Why in the world, in fact, uh, our uh, way of thinking is, why didn't you protect me from all of this bad stuff? And over my years in uh, ministry, I've seen more than a few become disillusioned with God because he did not do what they thought he should have done and therefore, they thought it's worth nothing. It's worth nothing. In fact, uh, the Apostle Paul had a disciple, that he, a, a young man that he was discipling in the Lord. His name was Demas. And in his first uh, letter to Timothy, Paul talked about Demas, about how great he was. But in his second letter, just a few years later, he said, Demas has left me. He's deserted me because he's uh, loved the world. In other words, he didn't want to experience the trial, the difficulty, the pain, the sacrifice, and it's easy just to go along with the flow, just to keep your head down, just to enjoy the favor of the world around you. And so a lot of people, and Jesus knows this, so did Paul, when it gets difficult and they think, you know what? And we have this transactional idea that, hey, God, I'm going to do this. And if I do this for you, then you're going to do X, Y, and Z for me. And that's not how our relationship with Jesus is. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. He's not here to do our bidding. We're, do, we're here to do his. We're here to honor him and to promote his agenda, not our own. And so I think in our world, um, when we have this idea that if I follow Jesus, that my life is going to just get better and better and better, we've set people up for something that is false. And when the going gets tough, people get going. And so Jesus says, I know your affliction. I understand the pain that you're going through because of me, because of your commitment and uh, your allegiance to me. And then he says, and not only do I know your affliction, I also know your poverty. Why were they poor? Uh, Smyrna was a rich city. It was a port city, a lot of commerce going through Smyrna. They were poor because when they said Jesus is Lord and they wouldn't confess that Caesar is Lord, they would lose their jobs. They lost their position. They uh, were looted and stolen from, and they had nothing. Uh, they were having trouble providing for their families. That's why they were poor. Um, and it's just a reminder to me, um, 
of um, what has been so common, especially in the United States of America, uh, this, this idea of a prosperity gospel, that if we follow Jesus, that financial prosperity follows us. And the reality is that's just simply not promised. Because if it were, Jesus would not have said, I know your tribulation and your poverty. He would have said, I know your tribulation and I'm going to make you rich from now on. Don't worry about it. I've got it. No, no, that's not the way it is. And so when we, even in our day, struggle with our finances, we think, God, where are you? Aren't you supposed to? And God says, sometimes it is costly to follow me. Sometimes to remain and maintain your allegiance to me, sometimes it is costly. And to the church in Smyrna, he did not promise them any relief from their financial distress. He just said, I know what you're going through. I know the pain. I know the sacrifice. And then he said, which almost seems out of place, but it's not. He says, but you are rich. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, um, in the midst of their struggle, right, in the midst of their suffering and their pain, uh, they lost their possessions, they lost their ability to provide for their families. There was something very real and permanent, however, about their wealth, and that was that their wealth, as they were serving Jesus and uh, maintaining their allegiance to Jesus, they were uh, building treasure in heaven, They were building eternal rewards in heaven because of their sacrifice, and it was permanent. They were rich in the eyes of God, and their faithfulness to Jesus was achieving for them something that was marvelous. In fact, this is what the apostle Peter would write in his first epistle, uh, 1 Peter chapter uh, 1. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then he goes on and into a what? A what? Treasures. Into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Regardless of where your your status is on life, as you follow Jesus, as you maintain your faithfulness to him, God rewards you in heaven with eternal riches that cannot be robbed from you, that cannot be lost or stolen. Where did did Peter get this idea? Where did Peter say, you know what, Uh, you're, um, you're piling up riches in heaven as you follow Jesus? Where did he get that idea from? Jesus. That's where he got it from. This is what Jesus uh, said in Matthew chapter 6. He said, don't store up for yourselves treasures, wealth on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But, he said, it is appropriate for you to store up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven. Wealth in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where where thieves do not break in and steal. Um, Some of you are old enough to have seen this cycle go on in our own culture that wealth can vanish overnight, can it? The economy goes upside down and uh, you you lose your job, you lose your house, you lose everything. And then all of a sudden you spend your life saving trying to put food on the table for someone. Wealth can be over. Someone can come in and and rob you blind. And that happens. People can scam you out of uh, your savings. Your house can burn down and you lose it all. And yet in our culture, and it's, it's easy to do this in our culture because we are a wealthy nation. It's easy to put our hope in our earthly wealth and not think at anything about what we're doing and storing up in heaven. And Jesus says, you've lost your possessions. You've been stolen from, you've been pillaged, you've lost your jobs because of me, and I'm just here to tell you uh, that you are rich in the sight of God. You are rich in the sight of God. You see, this is really the idea that Jesus was saying, true riches come through faithfulness to Jesus and fruitfulness in his kingdom. 
As we're faithful to Jesus, he sees, he knows, and he rewards. It's not that we earn our salvation. We don't do that. But he does see our faithfulness to him. He does see our fruitfulness in the kingdom. And as a result, that's how we store up treasures in heaven uh, that can never spoil or fade or be taken from us. And so Jesus says, "I, I know your tribulation. I know your poverty, but you are rich. And then he says... And I know the slander of those who say they are Jews but are not, but are are a synagogue of Satan. Have you ever had someone slander you? Now, uh, to be slandered is different than to be the victim of gossip. Gossip is just, I'm, I'm just talking about a situation that I, you know, I'm not the problem and I'm not the solution. Slander, on the other hand, is when someone says something about you that is false in order to destroy you. And this is what was happening uh, to the disciples in Smyrna. Whether it was from the Roman citizens or for, uh, from whether it was uh, from their Jewish counterparts, um, they were being slandered. They were being slandered. And Jesus says, um, this is coming from the Jews who think they're God's people, but they're really a synagogue of Satan. To synagogue of Satan um, uh, is Jesus saying they're actually doing Satan's bidding. You see, the Jewish people, uh, um, and and rightly so, they felt like they were the chosen people of God, the special people of God, and they were. God uh, pulled them out through Abraham and created a nation from Abraham to bring the Messiah. And when the Messiah came, what happened was uh, most of the Jewish nation rejected the very Messiah that God created their nation uh, to produce. And so they thought they were doing God's bidding. They thought they were true Jews. But Jesus says they're not. They're not doing my work. They're not doing uh, God's work. In fact, uh, they're conspiring with Satan to torment you. You say, James, what what are you saying? Well, I'm saying what the Apostle Paul said. I'm saying what Jesus is saying here. This is what Paul says in the book of Romans. Chapter 9, verses 7 and 8, neither are all of Abraham's children his descendants. In other words, the Jewish nation was birthed through Abraham, and everybody just thought, since I'm of the lineage of Abraham, then I'm, you know, I'm one of God's chosen people. That is, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, Paul says, but the children of the promise are considered to be the offspring. The promise of what? The promise of the Messiah. He would say this in chapter 2, verse 28. For a person is not a Jew who was one outwardly, who's a true Jew. Not the one who's uh, a descendant of Abraham, not the one who's nationally a Jew. He's not the, uh, the true Jew is not the person who's one outwardly. The true Jew is the one who has circumcision that's not visible in the flesh. He goes on, verse 29. I messed that verse up, but you got it. It's on the screen. On the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is of the heart by the spirit, not the letter. In other words, a person who is truly a a child of God is not someone who is descendant from a national line, but is descendant from the spirit of God, who's been born of the spirit of God. And Jesus says, these are the people who have rejected me and they're not really the children of God. They're actually in cahoots with Satan because they're persecuting you. Because the Jews had rejected their Messiah, they were on the outs with God. They were serving Satan's purposes, not God's. And so Jesus says, I want you to know that they're going around saying that they're uh, the, the real people of God, but I want you to know Uh, Because they've rejected me, I've rejected them. And you, you, disciples in Smyrna, are mine. Same is true of us today. That um, for those who embrace the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, we can be born into the family of faith, and we then become the people of God. What an encouragement that must have been to people who were getting it from all sides. 
thinking, Jesus, do you understand? God, do you know? And he says, I know your affliction. I know your poverty. And I know the slander that's being brought against you by people who should be my people, but they're not. They're in league with Satan. Um, and what Jesus says here, I think sometimes <laughs> because of the culture that we live in, because of the culture that we live in, we forget, we forget that Satan is real. We think that our opposition, that when people oppose us as followers of Jesus, that it's people opposing us, but it's not. That's why the Apostle Paul would write in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, he would say, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. It's against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Uh, this, is, this is motivated by satanic influence. And Jesus says, I'm just telling you, uh, these are people who are not bad people necessarily, but they are doing the bidding of Satan himself. And sometimes uh, you and I forget that. We think that a group of people or a, somebody of a different political persuasion is the enemy. They're not. There's something spiritual going on behind the scenes and we need to understand that. We need to understand that. And so uh, then Jesus says in verse 10, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. And I'm sure as they heard those words read that they thought, oh, don't be afraid because he's going to rescue us. <laughs> but that's not what he says. Jesus is not going to promise to rescue them uh, he didn't promise to rescue them. There are worse things to suffer than external pain or persecution or even death. And we'll see that in a moment. He says, don't, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. He goes on, look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison and to test you, and you will experience affliction for 10 days. Again, he comes back and says, hey, I'm just telling you, you think that you, the people are your opposition. They're not. They're in league. They're, they're doing the bidding of Satan, and I want you to identify where that opposition comes from. It's a spiritual opposition that manifests itself in the real uh, time and space right now. And I want you to know that you don't have to be afraid. Uh, some of you are going to be thrown into prison, and, and uh, some of you, some of you will experience affliction for 10 days. Now, there are a lot of different people who say a lot of different things about this 10 days. Is it literal or not? Uh, and without going into all the details, maybe sometime we'll go through the entire book of Revelation. I'll explain this to you. But no, don't like that. I don't like that either. But anyway, um, numbers in the book of Revelation are not to be taken literally, they would be taken figuratively. So what's he saying? John is saying this, hey listen, you're going to go through a difficult time, but, but in, uh, relatively speaking, it is a short time and it is definite. In other words, it will come to an end. That's what he means. You're gonna have affliction for 10 days in light of eternity, in light of the length of the years. In other words, it's a short time in comparison to all things and it does come to an end. We do have a promise that um, when we experience pain, especially because of our faith in Jesus, because of our allegiance to Jesus, that it is a temporary pain. It is a temporary sacrifice. And for the church in Smyrna, that would have been so encouraging. Jesus knows, he sees, and he's with them, he's among them. And then it says in the rest of verse 10, be faithful to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. Far from promising to rescue them, from making all of their problems go away, from removing the threat, from removing the pain, he actually says, some of you are going to die. And what I'm calling you to do is to be faithful to the point of death. I wonder, if this, if, uh, if this statement by Jesus were not the very thing that Polycarp clung to as he gave himself to the flames, be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. There is a reward for your faithfulness. 
There is a reward for maintaining your allegiance to Jesus. He is Lord. He is your king. Again, uh, we don't follow Jesus because of a promise to make our lives better. We follow Jesus because he is the risen Lord and king of the universe, and he, de- and he deserves and he demands our allegiance. That's why we follow him. That's why. And Jesus says, when you uh, remain faithful through the end, there's the promise of the crown of life. This idea of the crown of life, this idea of eternal reward was not something that was unfamiliar to the people. In fact, uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus, writes about this crown of life in uh, James chapter 1, verse 12. He said, blessed is the one who endures trials. Are you getting the theme here? Who endures trials because when he has stood the test, when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. I don't know what you're enduring today. Maybe it's not the threat of your life. But I do know what God has promised. I do know that no matter uh, what external pain or what external pressure or, or what sacrifices that you have to make because of your allegiance to Jesus, that he says, there is a reward. There is riches in heaven for you. Uh, that's not like a pie in the sky. Th- those, are from, those are from the lips of Jesus. And then he says in verse 11, let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. That would include us today. The one who conquers will never be harmed by the second death. The one who conquers will never be harmed by the second death. Um, What's Jesus saying here? Jesus is reminding the disciples in Smyrna, that there is something worse, listen, there is something worse than affliction or tribulation. There is something worse than losing your wealth and your status and your possessions. There's something worse than that. There's something worse than uh, persecution in this life. What's worse? It's the second death. That's what's worse. You say, well, James, what's, what's the second death? In a word, hell, eternal separation from God in a real place called hell. Now, we don't like to talk about that in our culture, but Jesus talks about it. And Jesus warns people, listen, I'm just telling you, there is a second death. But here's the good news of Jesus. The good news of Jesus is you don't have to experience the second death. You don't have to. Let me put it this way. If you are only born once, you will die twice. If you are only born once, you will die twice. You will will be born into this life and you will physically die. And if you are not born again, you will die the second death. Destruction from God in hell. But, on the other hand, uh, if you are born twice you will only die once. Because Jesus says you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so the question then comes to all of us, have you been born again? Have have you experienced new birth from the Spirit of God? Have you uh, given and surrendered your life to King Jesus? Because um, if you have not, then you have the second death ahead of you. And Jesus says, for those who uh, are faithful to me, uh, the second death uh, will not touch them, will not harm them. And so, what does it take to endure hardship for Jesus? What does it take to maintain uh, faithfulness and allegiance to Jesus in the face of opposition? You know what it takes? You know what it takes? It take, and this is our bottom line for today. It, it takes this, that Jesus in your life must be bigger than death itself. Jesus in your life 
must be bigger than death itself. Je- Let me put it another way. Jesus in your life must be bigger than your wealth. Jesus in your life must be bigger than your family. Jesus in your life must be bigger. You face opposition at work. You face opposition uh, at school. You face opposition in your family. You face opposition wherever you go. And what does it, uh, a lot of times in our culture, it is we just keep our head down and we just nod and, and just, you know, we don't want to create any problems and we just go along. And that's exactly what happened to Demas who left Jesus, who left Paul because it was just easier to go with the world. You and I every day face a challenge to compromise, face a challenge just to take the easy route. If we face that, think about the the disciples, the followers of Jesus in Smyrna, how easy would have it been just to say, Caesar is Lord, I really don't mean it, but Caesar is Lord, I want to keep my job. Caesar's Lord, I, I don't want my kids to, you know, Caesar's Lord, it's, I don't mean it. But they would not. Jesus must be bigger than any threat that we face, than any hardship that we face. And we know that if, 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 if we face hardship for the sake of Jesus, there is a reward He sees your allegiance. He sees your faithfulness. He sees your affliction. He sees your pain. He sees and he knows. And he's there. This week, you say, James, what do I do? This week, here's what I want you to do. This week in your groups, for those of you who are are in a home group, I want you to talk about this question among all the other questions that you get from the study guide that we give to you. But how do you prepare yourself for difficult times because of your commitment or allegiance to Jesus? How do you do that? That's what you need to talk about this week. You need to encourage one another. How, how, do, how do I prepare myself for difficult times? Because uh, more than likely, they will come. In our culture, in our day, as we uh, move you know, faster and faster away uh, from Jesus, uh, it'll come. And so how do you prepare yourself for difficult times? Because of your commitment or because of your allegiance to Jesus. And if you're not in a group, if you're just kind of listening to this, then you need, you need to sit down and you need to have a conversation with people you live with. Say, okay, what are we going to do? What, what happens when I, I'm forced to do something that I know dishonors Jesus in my, at school or at work or in the club or wherever it is? What do, what do we do? How do we handle that? What, how do we prepare ourselves to maintain our allegiance to Jesus? Because um, it more than likely will come to that. Relationships have to be sacrificed. A promotion needs to be not that important or whatever. How do you prepare yourself for all that? I love what um, the Apostle Peter writes. 1 Peter chapter 3 says this, but even if you should suffer for righteousness, in other words, even if you should suffer for the cause of Christ, you are blessed. I don't feel blessed. I'm suffering. I know. I'm poor. I know. Jesus said, you're rich. But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Don't fear what they fear. Don't be intimidated by those around you. Verse 15, but he says, in your hearts, regard Christ the Lord as holy. Revere him ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you because people will look at you and say, you're nuts. All you have to do is say, Jesus is Lord. All you have to do is bow and do what they want you to do. Even if you don't mean it, just say it. Lie. Peter says, no, 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 no. Because when they see your allegiance to Jesus, when they see your faithfulness to Jesus, they will marvel. And then he says, he's not done, he says this, yet do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. Don't be a jerk about it, but be faithful to Jesus. 
And in the end, they'll be ashamed because there's nothing they can pin on you. And then he says in verse 17, for it is better to suffer for doing good, for being faithful to Jesus, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. It's better, uh, if it's God's will, that you be faithful to him, and it is, and then you should suffer because of that. It's better to do that than just to go along because you don't want to suffer the pain. You see, if you're going to maintain your faithfulness to Jesus, if you're going to maintain your allegiance to Jesus, he must be bigger. He must be bigger. Let's pray. God, you are good. And we are so grateful that um, our dear brothers and sisters in this city, Smyrna, uh, 2,000 years ago, that even though uh, they um, were experiencing external pressure and pain and persecution and um, they lost their ability to provide for their families and many of them lost their possessions and many even lost their lives, that uh, you in the midst of that came near to them to encourage them. And Father, I pray that um, what they experienced would be instructive for us. And we're grateful for the country in which we live. We're grateful for the heritage that we have of faith in this nation. But we also realize, Lord, that there are times uh, when faithfulness to you and allegiance to you is costly. And so, Father, I pray that we would elevate Jesus as Lord and King so that whatever the opposition is, we maintain our faithfulness and our allegiance to him. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.